I'm a perpetual traveler through the Bible. Please join me for the next part of my journey through the scriptures. Stay as long as you like, and let us together discover a bit more about the Bible. One of the most common questions that Christians have to deal with when talking to agnostics or atheists is why God allows sin to continue uncontrolled. Why does God allow sinners to prosper and succeed? And why does God allow Satan to continue to deceive and to destroy? These questions have been asked by everyone, both believers and unbelievers, since the very beginning. If God exists and He is holy, why doesn't He stop all the destruction, all the corruption, and all the confusion? If God loves His children, why does He allow them to suffer? When will God destroy the wicked? When will God deal with Satan? When will Jesus come again and fix the earth? When will the righteous be avenged and the wicked punished? To put it in the words of David the psalmist, How long, O Lord, how long? For millennia, righteous men have been crying for God to intervene, and we have not stopped asking, When will God speak? When will God break His silence? God has promised that the day will come when the mystery of His silence will be broken, and that day is linked with the seventh trumpet in Revelation chapter 10, verse 7. In the days of the trumpet called to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled, just as he announced to his servants the prophets. The time when the seventh angel blows the seventh trumpet is when the great mystery of an apparently silent God will end. All the plans and all the purposes of God concerning men and the world will be carried out. Christ will come. His kingdom will be established on earth. Satan will be stopped, bound in chains and imprisoned, and with him all his demons. Righteousness will rule, Christ will be king, and God will speak. At that time, the Bible tells us the curse on the earth will be lifted. Sin with all its carnage of broken hearts, broken dreams, and broken lives will all be healed. All the mockers, the agnostics, the atheists, and the unbelievers who scoffed and said, Where is God? will be silenced. The thousands and thousands of years of sin, death, lies, murders, thefts and believers being maligned and martyred will be over. Chapter 10 and the first half of chapter 11 of Revelation is brief. It introduces a break between the sixth and the seventh trumpet judgments. This interlude consists of two main events. Firstly, John sees a mighty angel and is instructed to symbolically eat a little scroll. Then at the beginning of chapter 11, John is instructed to measure parts of the temple and is given further end times prophecies. In the last podcast of Journey Through the Scriptures, we learned about the first mystery of Revelation 10, the mighty angel, and got clues as to his identity from his actions and his appearance, robed in clouds with a rainbow above his head and his face like the sun. All clues pointed to the angel of Yahweh being Jesus himself, who only appears when Israel is in the focus of God's plan. This mighty angel calls out, and the result is the answer of the seven thunders, which is found in Revelation 10 verses 1 to 3. What follows is a rare instance where God explicitly instructs someone, John in this case, not to reveal what he has seen and heard. He is told to seal up what the seven thunders have said, and do not write it down. This is the only part of Revelation that still remains sealed. The rest of Revelation has been unsealed for our benefit, but not the words contained in the seven thunders. These have not been revealed yet. Only John knows what the seven thunders uttered. Thunder has always been a symbol of the judgment of God, so this must be something to do with judgment. We do not know why it was sealed as John does not tell us. Perhaps he did not know himself. He simply obeyed what he was told to do. And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives for ever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it, the earth and what is in it, and the sea and what was in it, that there would be no more delay, but that in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled, just as he announced to his servants the prophets. This gives us a glimpse of what is coming in the book of Revelation. Firstly, this mighty angel begins by raising his right hand to heaven. 
This is what you have to do in court when you take an oath. This is where that ritual originated. The raising of the hand is a sign that a solemn oath is about to be taken. The angel swore by God, the one who created the earth, the heaven and the sea and everything in them. So, if this angel is Jesus himself, then why does he swear and take an oath if he is God himself? In Hebrews 6 verses 13, we read that when God wanted to swear an oath to Abraham that he would keep his promises to him, we are told that because he would swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. This is what Jesus is doing here. He is swearing by the triune God, Father, Son and the Holy Spirit, that there will be no longer any delay in explaining the mystery of God. God has apparently delayed for centuries in answering the questions of men. We read in Acts that even the early Christians expected Jesus to return in their day. Paul certainly expected Jesus' return in his lifetime. Both of Paul's letters to the Thessalonian church focus on teaching and encouraging these believers about the second coming of Christ. In fact, every generation of Christians, since the first century AD, have been expecting the Lord to return in their time. But he has not come yet. Today we are expecting the Lord to return. But when the seventh angel blows his trumpet, the angel says, There will be no more delay. And when it happens, God will begin his reign on the earth. Did you know that God has never reigned on earth up to this point of time? He has been king over the heaven and the earth and the whole universe, but he has never yet reigned on earth. He has ruled on earth because he governs human events and controls history, but he does so remotely. He has never openly reigned upon the earth. But when the seventh angel sounds his trumpet, then God will begin to reign. There is a clue about this in Revelation chapter 11, verses 17. There we find the twenty-four elders praising God and saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. That is the day when that same prayer that we have been praying for so long that, until now, has remained unanswered, that says, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. John is told that this is what he announced to his servants, the prophets. Ezekiel chapter 36 gives us a vivid description of just how God will begin his kingdom on earth. He will bring the nation Israel back into prominence again. He will remove the heart of stone from them and give them a heart of flesh, and he will put his spirit within them. It has all been predicted in the prophets, and there are many, many such passages. In Romans 11, Paul tells us that this truth is important. He warns Gentile believers not to boast against Israel. There are many Christian teachers today who teach that Israel does not have any future at all, and all the promises of the Old Testament are to be applied to the church. When these replacement theologians say that, they fail to heed against what Paul warns them against in Romans 11 verses 18. Paul says, Do not be arrogant towards the branches. If you are, remember that it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. These promises belong to Israel and we Gentiles are allowed to benefit from them by the grace of God only. But they still belong primarily to Israel. In Romans 11 verses 25 to 27, Paul reminds us all of what the prophets have long been predicting. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way all Israel will be saved, as it is written, The Deliverer will come from Zion, he will banish ungodliness from Jacob, and this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. This will be the restoration of the earth under the reign of Christ. The next mystery appears in Revelation 10 verses 8 to 11. Then the voice that I heard from heaven spoke to me again, saying, Go, take the scroll that is open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and told him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, Take it and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel and ate it. It was sweet as honey in my mouth. 
and when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And I was told, you must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. The symbolism is very important here. Eating the little scroll is a way of depicting how the truth written on that scroll becomes personal. It becomes absorbed by your person and becomes part of you. This is what happens when we eat food. It becomes you. Doctors call it digestion or metabolism. The food we have eaten this morning is becoming part of us now. When John eats the scroll, it is a symbol that he is taking it into himself and becoming personally involved with it. This strange incident of eating a scroll is not unique to Revelation. This particular imagery comes from the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 2, verses 9, through to chapter 3, verses 3. But you, son of man, hear what I say to you. Do not be rebellious like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. And when I looked, behold, a hand was stretched out to me, and behold, a scroll of a book was in it. And he spread it before me, and it had writing on the front and on the back, and there were written on it words of lamentation and mourning and woe. And he said to me, Son of man, eat whatever you find here, eat the scroll, and go and speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he gave me this scroll to eat. And he said to me, Son of man, feed your belly with the scroll that I give you, and fill your stomach with it. Then I ate it, and it was in my mouth as sweet as honey. Then, when Ezekiel was sent to deliver the message to Israel, it says he went in bitterness and anger. This is found later in Ezekiel chapter 3, verses 14. That is very similar to what John is experiencing here. The prophecy contained in the scroll tastes sweet at first. How exactly God will fulfill his plan on earth certainly has an element of it that is wonderfully sweet. Yet, as John takes it in, eats it and absorbs it, he becomes personally involved. It begins to turn sour. He realizes that he has a part of this as well, not only in the final result, but also in the judgments that lead to it. This is often how scripture deals with us. We read a passage that speaks of our destiny as believers and read of the wonderful promises that God has in store for us. But as we meditate on it and read further, we begin to understand that God has plans to change us, to get us ready for that future that He has prepared for us, and we begin to realize that we are going to be personally involved in that preparation. We are going to have to lay aside our attitudes, opinions, and bigotries. There are bad habits that we must give up, and it is not going to be easy. Mark 9 verses 43 tells us that, If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. There is hurt and personal pain in obeying the word of the Lord, but it is all part of his plan. We must be careful of reading the judgments of Revelation and being unmoved, thinking that this is going to happen to other people in the end times, and that it does not concern us because the church will be raptured before these events. But judgment does touch us. God has already released judgments upon the earth, whether we like it or not. We feel uncomfortable when the word touches us personally, and we discover that we are part of the problem, and we must be changed as well as others. I am sure you remember that story of King David after his adulterous affair with Bathsheba and after arranging the murder of her husband so that he could take her for himself. David thought that no one knew about it. He thought he had gotten away with it. But God spoke to the prophet Nathan and sent him to David the king and told him a story of gross injustice in David's kingdom. This can be found in 2 Samuel chapter 12. When David heard this, he was very angry. His sense of justice was aroused. But suddenly David was confronted with the fact that God's judgment had touched him as well when Nathan declared that, You are that man. When it happened here to John and he ate the scroll, it was sweet in his mouth, but it turned sour in his stomach. But only then was he given a new assignment in verse 11, and was told, You must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. There is an important principle illustrated here. After you have personally entered into the meaning of judgment, and God has judged you as well as others, 
and you have felt the hand of God upon you, then and only then will you be prepared to speak to someone else about the program of God. Here in Revelation 10 verses 11, John is given here the privilege of ministering again to nations and peoples and languages and kings. That is going to be the theme of the next chapters of Revelation, chapters 11, 12, 13 and 14. We are going to find the pronounced change of scene in Revelation at this point. John will be sent back over the terrible scenes of judgment to highlight and focus on certain characters and personalities and to tell us more details about them. This process will involve, as it says, many peoples and nations and languages and kings. That is going to be the theme of the next chapters of Revelation. There is a lot more to come, and I am hoping and praying that we will realize that as we are having this book revealed to us through God's Holy Spirit, and it is entering us, it will let us speak with personal conviction to others. For too long, we have been frightened of offending others and becoming unpopular and rejected. Isn't it time to take the message of Revelation seriously? This is David Wiles, your fellow traveler in Christ, and this has been the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast, episode 38.